Okay, so I think we'll make a start. Um, welcome everybody and good afternoon or good morning, depending on, on where you join us from. Uh, my name is Callum Ryder. I'm the marketing manager here at Raytech. Uh, you join us today for the, the CPD webinar, how to specify lighting for NPR or LPR systems. Um, so I'll quickly take you through the agenda and the next slide. Um, just, just quickly before we do that, talk about the housekeeping rules. Um, so we, we have a, allocated some time um, at the end of the webinar to answer any of your questions. And you should notice in the control panel of your GoToWeb, go to the GoToWebinar um, panel that you can you have a question section there where you can type the questions in. So please feel free to type the questions out and submit them as we run through the webinar. Um, and then when it comes to the end, hopefully we'll be able to get through um, as many as many as we can of those um, before the end. So as I say, please please type them away as we as we go through. Um, we'll be making the slides available um, after the webinar. Um, so we'll send an email around to everybody um, who's on today um, with a copy of the slides as well as a feedback form um, where you can send any comments um, as well. So uh, that's the, the housekeeping rules. So I think we'll we'll make a start and we'll quickly run through the agenda. Um, so I'm going to start by giving a quick uh, introduction to, to ANPR or LPR and just to mention that throughout the, the uh, duration of this webinar I'll be mainly referring to it as LPR or capturing the plate and um, it really just depends on, on where you're from um, and whether you refer to the plate as number plate or license plate or registration plate and um, so as I say for the duration of this webinar I'll be mainly refer referring to it as LPR um, so we'll, we'll start by looking at what LPR is and why lighting is so critically important for any successful system um, and then we'll look at the technical challenges and the key elements of capturing a high quality image of the plate. We look at the key considerations when specifying lighting. So we'll look at the different wavelengths of light um, available, pros and cons of constant versus pulse light, um, how to overcome challenging operating environmental conditions, and how to set up and control your illumination. Um, and then at the end, we will provide you with a, um, our rule of thumb on how to specify um, the right illuminator for your project, followed by a Q&A session at the end, as I say, where we can deal with any questions, but please feel free to submit those as we go through. So that's the agenda for this afternoon. Starting with our introduction. So what is LPR? So at a basic level, it's being able to capture a high quality image of a vehicle's plate, being able to interpret that image and then being able to do something with the information. So we look at some of the typical applications in the next slide, but it's important at this point that we clearly distinguish between the term capture and the term recognition. So when we refer to capture, we're talking about that initial stage of enabling a camera system and all associated elements to obtain a clear quality image of the plate. Whereas recognition refers to that secondary stage of intelligently interpreting um, and analyzing those captured images. So throughout this webinar, we'll be focusing solely on that initial stage of image capture of the plate. And with that in mind, um, LPR systems play a vital role in a wide range of intelligent transport systems. And here we've got a, a few examples on the image on the screen. So starting from the, the far left, you know, carpet access. So this is a project we we're involved with the um, Heathrow Airport. Um, speed monitoring systems. Anyone in the UK will be familiar with that second image um, on the screen there. And even with more advanced systems such as driver recognition or mobile phone detection, there's often still a requirement to capture the, the vehicle's plate. So um, it kind of gives you a flavor that uh, LPR systems um, or the use of an LPR system is a key element um, in many different intelligent transport systems. Um, so knowing there's a variety of different types of systems, we can summarize sort of the main objectives that each is likely to have in their three main areas. Uh, but it's important to say that in many cases, the system will have more than one primary objective, but one of those is likely to be to detect and deter. Um, so just the presence of an LPR system can be enough to deter crime, ensuring vehicles keep within speed limits or reducing drive-offs from filling stations, um, and generally assisting with, with crime prevention and, and detection. Uh, revenue collection, um, things like car parks, toll roads, city centre access, London's congestion charges is, is a good example of that. Um, but all related to, to revenue collection and for control and security. So it may be part of an access control system to automatically allow access to authorized vehicles or maybe used as part of a, a video surveillance system for enhanced security um, or as part of a larger ITS project for, for controlling traffic such as smart motorways. Um, as I said, in many, in many cases, the system may have more than one objective, but 
I think it's important to say whatever the, whatever the purpose of the system for it to work successfully and reliably, the quality of the images is, is vitally important. And in many cases, the operation of such systems is, is mission critical. They simply have to work. So let's consider the specific technical challenges and the key components of, of capturing the plate. So basically, a, a traditional camera setup cannot provide the quality of pictures re required reliably for 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and regardless of weather conditions and operating requirements. So you need a system which overcomes the problems of getting an excellent image of the plate and address the, the important challenges of basically speed. Um, so fast moving vehicles, um, which causes image blur. Um, the headlights of a vehicle will, will blind traditional cameras. Without dedicated lighting, normal cameras can't provide a picture in low or zero light con zero light conditions. Sunlight will cause um, will cause glare and reflections. And other light sources may interfere with the, with the camera as well. Uh, poor and variable weather conditions um, can significantly affect the, the picture from a normal camera as well. And variability in plate, which is such as clean clean or dirty plate, is an additional challenge. Um, but what we're seeing here is these elements of speed, headlights, reflections, low light, changeable weather conditions, they're all common to, to installations that want to capture the plate. Um, and a little bit more on plates as well. So different plates from around the world can have their own specific issues and challenges, which we'll touch on a, a little bit later. So key elements of capturing the plate. So you, you have to adopt a systems, a systems wide approach when, when you're trying to capture the plate. Um, the quality of the image will be based on the combination of the camera, lens, any filtering used, and the lighting. And an old adage in computing applies as well here, so garbage in, garbage out. So you need to obtain um, great pictures if you want an effective system. So when clients ask our recommendations for setup, um, this is what we normally advise to achieve the, the best results based on many, many years of first-hand and practical experience. Um, so we'll run through each one in, in a bit more detail, but I think one thing which is common to, to all um, is the use of good quality components, which is, is vital for a high-performing system. Um, and something which I'll say many times throughout this webinar, there's no substitute for actual testing. So starting with a camera, you'll want to use a fast shutter to overcome, overcome motion blur minimum gain to reduce noise on the picture and increase gamma to maximize contrast. For the lens, you'll need to use a high f-stop to eradicate unwanted light and manage changing lighting and weather conditions. And that high f-stop will also improve uh, the focusing and the depth of field. Um, a narrow bandpass filter should be used to block any unwanted light and um, while it's not re reducing the usable light from your, from your illuminator. So that's important, but it's applicable only to, to infrared applications only. Um, critically, the right quality, quantity, positioning and control of the lighting system is vital for an effective system also. Uh, so we have a couple of images on screen here, um, looking at the left, uh, just to begin with. So here we're using no infrared or additional lighting. Um, we're not applying the, the magic formula, which I've just been through in the previous slide. And, and effectively what we have is, is an unusable image um, where the plate is, is not visible and can't, cannot be used by the, by the LPR system. On the right um, is what we can achieve when we apply the magic formula, um, which we talked about in the previous slide. So a clear, high quality image of the plate. And this image is, is taken from some previous testing that we, that we did um, and demonstrates some of the challenges challenges of var variable plates. So if you compare the plates mounted um, to the board on the right-hand side um, you know, and the, the one on the vehicle also, um, you can see that some of those plates are not retro reflective and, and not clearly visible. So this just sort of demonstrates visually the, the challenges um, that we touched on in the, in the previous slide. So we've established why lighting is so important um, to LPR systems. Now we're gonna look at the, the key factors to consider when you're specifying an illuminator for these for these systems. So um, we'll investigate some of these factors in the slide in more, in more depth later on in the, in the presentation, um, but I'll just quickly run through all of them and delve a little bit deeper into some areas. Um, 
So the type of illumination, I mean, you consider the, the appropriate wavelength of light, um, and we'll also compare um, the, uh, the pros and cons of using constant versus pulse lighting. The challenges of the demanding operating conditions, so the environment requirements of these types of systems, um, in addition to the above, the normal application specific elements of lighting design, um, which I'll briefly touch on a bit more detail now. So we have the distance, we need to accurate, accurately calculate how far away um, image capture is actually taking place from the camera. And the field of view, so the field of view of the lighting should be matched with the field of view of the camera and the lens, and that will dictate the angle um, of the illuminator which you the illuminator which you choose. And typically, um, most LPR systems are able to cover at least one or two lanes of traffic um, per camera or per illuminator. Uh, and physical location is, is really important. So we would always recommend being no more than 30 degrees off axis of the plate to maximize its hopefully retroreflective qualities. Um, and it's vitally important that the camera and illuminator are closely co-located, otherwise that useful light uh, will be wasted. Um, and because of the nature of, of retroreflective plates, this is, this is really important. Um, so considering all the above factors will help determine the size and the power um, of the illuminator required. As you've touched upon, high power and quality illumination is essential for transport applications, faster, um, faster shutter speeds, higher f-stops, they need more light, and we'll, we'll see just how much more later on in, in future slides. And hopefully by the end of the webinar, we'll have helped you specify the power and the quality of the illumination which you require. So firstly, let's consider the pros and cons of different wavelengths of light for, for an LPR project. So we'll start with infrared and specifically 850 nanometer infrared. So IR enables the camera to provide monochrome images. Um, 850 nanometer IR is not visible to the human eye, although there is a faint red glow when looking directly at the illuminator. Um, from our security background and use of IR for video surveillance systems, we generally describe this as semi-COVID. Um, but what does this mean in the context of an LPR system? Uh, so monochrome images are generally sufficient, so providing black and white images that are clear and high quality. Uh, because the light is not visible to the human eye, it means it doesn't distract the driver, um, they, and they won't be aware or troubled by the use of 850 nanometer infrared. And while it's not visible to the human eye, cameras are very responsive to it, so that helps in being able to obtain a high quality image. And probably most significantly for any wavelength any wavelength of infrared, it also helps to overcome issues with sunlight, glare and headlights by allowing the opportunity to filter out that unwanted light with a suitable bandpass filter. And so for these reasons, 850 nanometer infrared light is the preferred wavelength for the vast majority of LPR systems. and We would always recommend it where possible. But it doesn't mean that IR is the only type of light to consider for use in LPR applications. So we'll take a quick look at, at white light now. Um, not that I need to explain this in too much detail, but obviously the white light can provide the camera with color images, and it's also highly visible to the human eye. But again, in the context of an LPR system, well, it can be of use if we need, if we need to identify the color of a plate or colors on the plate. Um, number plates vary dramatically from country to country or even state to state if in the, in the US or other countries. So capturing color may be a requirement depending on where you are. Um, similarly, we need to identify the color of the, we may need to identify the color of the vehicle um, as well as the image of the plate. There may be other lighting goals um, which which means that light white light should be considered. Um, but on the downside, um, it can be very distracting for the driver because it's visible to, to humans unlike infrared or 850 nm infrared and it's harder to achieve results. So the camera isn't as receptive to white light as it is to infrared and also means we can't filter out any unwanted light. So things like things like the headlights, sunlight and glare are going to become much more of an issue for using white light as your, your source of illumination. Uh, we, we tend to find that white light is sometimes used um, in the Middle East and Far East applications in some territories in, in the Americas. Uh, and I just want to quickly touch upon some of the other wavelengths that you might hear um, discussed around um, transport applications occasionally. Uh, so 730 nanometers, um, LEDs um, are less powerful, less efficient, um, and it is more, more distracting for, for drivers. So there is potential here um, for confusion with traffic lights due to the, the, the red output from the illuminator, um, which is obviously dangerous for, for an LPR um, application. 940 nanometers, so cameras are 
less sensitive to this wavelength, uh, lenses are less efficient, and they may be focusing performance challenges. So in short, uh, only consider the use of 940 nanometer infrared if covert operation is, is essential. Um, other than that, there, there are very few upsides for, for using it. Um, but generally speaking, other specialist wavelengths um, may be used for very specific technical reasons or for, for certain territories. Um, but the availability of suitable LEDs, which are powerful enough in different IR wavelengths, is certainly a challenge. So now we've chosen the wavelength of light, typically 850 nanometer infrared. Um, so we're going to consider now two different modes of operating that light, so constant mode or pulse mode. Um, I will say at the start here that we have to offer both of these types of lights, so we can be impartial when it comes to recommending which is best for, for LPR, but we'll look at these in a bit more detail here. And we'll start with, with constant light. So constant light is basically lightning which is switched on 100% of the time, um, and it means that the light um, is constantly available for the camera. It means that we don't need to use a trigger. Um, a trigger is not necessary to initiate the light because it's it's always there. Um, and perhaps the big advantage of constant light is that it makes setup and maintenance easier. And there's certainly less to consider in terms of setup when compared to, to pulse lighting, um, which we'll just discuss in a, a couple of slides time. Uh, so we've got a simple graph here which demonstrates constant light. So the vertical axis refers to the intensity of light and the horizontal axis to the to time. Um, and as you can see, the, the light remains on at a constant level. Um, I think this graph will probably have a bit more meaning when we, we compare it to pulse light. Um, but while constant light may be available to the camera 100% of the time, um, a typical LPR camera is not constantly capturing Im images, um, which leads us quite nicely into, into discussing pulse light. So in order to, to use pulse light, we assume that the shutter speed has been adjusted or shortened um, to remove image, image blur, um, which would otherwise be caused by the speed of, of traffic. So typically, you would expect to see shutter speeds of at most a thousandth of a second or shorter. Um, for pulse lighting, the, the light is only on when the, the camera shutter is open. Um, so we refer to this as a, as, a, as a lightning pulse or a strobe. And to do this, the lumen needs to be synchronized with the shutter of the LPR camera, usually via transistic logic uh, input. So this is made possible um, due to the fast switching capability of LEDs. Uh, the system may require more testing to establish the required pulse settings and also means that setup, commissioning and maintenance may be more complex um, when co as compared to, to, to constant light. But there are significant benefits to using a pulse illuminator. So Referring now to the same graph from a, a couple of slides ago, the constant light line uh, is still shown there, but we have now added a, a pulse light trace. Um, so you can see that the light is, is off, so zero intensity for most of the time. And there are occasional bursts or pulses um, of high power light. So these need to be triggered and synchronized with the camera. Um, and this provides us with lots of potential benefits. But why would we go to the effort of pulse and light when we could just use constant? So critically, it allows us to generate far more usable light. So using an example, if the camera shutter is only open for one millisecond every 20 milliseconds, then the camera shutter is only open for 5% of the time. Because the LEDs are therefore being used for a fraction of the time compared to a constant light illuminator, this means they can be overdriven and able to deliver far more power. Typically, overdriving LEDs can deliver as much as five times more power from the same package. So this can help deliver longer achievable distances or brighter lighting at the same distance, um, ultimately enhancing image quality. Um, by the same token, it could also allow you to use a smaller lighter unit, which delivers additional cost savings. And because, um, because when pulsing the illuminator, but it's only on for a short base of time, it's actually switched off for the majority of that time. So this can help us significantly reduce power consumption by as much as, as 90%. And by the same token, um, with the illuminator being, being switched off for longer periods than it's switched on, pulsing can dramatically reduce the operating temperature of the illuminator as well, and could be a good solution for applications where you've got a, a high ambient temperature. And finally, pulse lighting also brings new opportunities with the illuminators being highly configurable, so they can be tailored um, to the needs of, of each application. We'll touch on some of that in the next slide. So when specifying a pulse system, there's a number of, of different settings to consider. 
Um, and I will say there's a trade off between these, these settings, but uh, firstly, the pulse width, i.e. the duration or the length of the pulse, this would typically be measured uh, in milliseconds, which perhaps gives you a bit of context about how short the length of time in which a, a pulse light is switched on for compared to a constant light. Um, and the pulse width should be matched exactly or at the very least overlap the time period um, that the camera shutter is open. Um, secondly, the pulse intensity or the height, um, i.e. how bright the light can be pulsed. Um, as we were saying earlier, this can deliver up to five times more light when compared to an equivalent constant light. And third, the frequency, i.e. how quickly can the light um, pulse or the rate in which it can be repeated and measured, usually in, in hertz. Um, as I said, there's a, there's a, there is a trade-off between all these three elements. Um, in general terms, the shorter the pulse width and the lower the pulse frequency um, allows for a maximum your maximum power. Um, and there are other settings as well, which you can adjust. It's not just these these three, um, but they tend to be related, um, or they tend to be the ones which ensure that the lighting pulse and the camera shutter can be perfectly coordinated. Typically, we might expect to see a pulse width of one to two milliseconds. Um, so this is a typical scenario, so a typical pulse width of one to two milliseconds at a frequency of 50 to 60 times per second, um, delivering a pulse intensity of up to five times the power. And that um, delivers energy savings of up to, of up to 90%, because the light is only on for five to 10% of the time, so significant energy savings there. So here we have a quick video um, where we can see the impact and the effect of using the same size illuminator both in constant and pulsed mode. Um, for comparison, so let me just quickly clear this for you. We'll say that the video has no sound, so don't try and adjust your, your, your settings, but here we go. Okay, so I'll just switch back to the slides now. So as I say, that was just a quick, a quick video which demonstrated the um, impact and effect of using the same size luminaire, both in constant mode and in pulse mode for a, for a quick bit of comparison. So just to summarize pulse lighting now. So as we've said, technically, yes, it is more, it is more challenging, but in our experience, the majority of high-end installations um, exploit the added benefit to be using full sliding, um, as we've discussed earlier on. Uh, and just a reminder that at Raytech we offer both solutions, so um, we can speak as, a, as an independent voice on the matter. So in addition to the technical challenge of specifying lighting, let's now look at some of the operating challenges which we should also consider. So. We mentioned earlier that the variable weather conditions can make capturing the plate a challenge, but it can also put a more physical strain on the illuminator itself. So LPR systems are deployed globally across varying climates and the illuminator and any other equipment must be able to withstand that. Um, also the nature of an LPR application means that the illuminator will be exposed to wind and vibration from passing traffic. If you think about an the illuminator or a camera perch on top of a gantry or a column on a motorway, there's likely very little protection for for that bit of equipment up there. And the illuminator, the illuminator must be able to perform alongside the rest of the system for 24 hours a day, 365 days per year. Um, that's particularly unusual for, for a lighting system. Often these types of systems are mission critical too. So um, you must be able to guarantee that they work 100% of the time. We talked about earlier about um, providing authorised vehicle access, so there's, there's simply no margin for error in those type of applications, so mission critical. Um, and access to these systems can sometimes be challenging as well, so um, especially if they're located in, in high traffic locations where it's difficult to, difficult to access. So 
with those factors in mind, what do you need to consider when you're specifying an illuminator? So firstly, you need to check the certification of the illuminator that you're specifying to ensure it complies with the demands of application. Do the temperature ratings match the demand of the environment? Has it been tested against vibration and so on? Um, the illuminator, as we've said, needs to be designed and fit for use in extreme environments. And is the illuminator feel proven from a, a reputable manufacturer? Do that, does that manufacturer have a track record in traffic and LPR projects? You know, these are important points to consider because um, you may well require their support further down the line, especially for more com complex uh, installations or projects. For example, if you're using pulse light, you know, you need to question is that support going to be available from the from the manufacturer supplying your, your illuminator? Uh, advanced lighting features can also help to address some of the challenges. So um, remote control capabilities, so um, fairly obviously for, for safer and easier setup from, from a ground level, and rather than necessarily having to be up a gantry or wherever the, the installation may be taking place. IP capability um, allows the light to be smart and programmable and is essentially means the lighting can respond to events, um, easier integration to bigger systems, easier commissioning and maintenance, and increased flexibility over the long term. So you need to consider how the illuminator can be controlled and how it will communicate with the, the rest of the devices in the system. Again, for more complex installation, we'd always recommend an illuminator, which is IP enabled for, for maximum long term flexibility. And then we have hybrid solutions as well, um, which essentially delivers multiple wavelengths um, from, from one package of one illuminator, um, traditionally white light and, and um, in the fixed limit infrared. So you've had a look at all the things we need to consider, the technical challenges, the operating challenges, specific application requirements. So we now look to make a recommendation on how to specify an illuminator. So I've mentioned the importance of testing a few times now, but just want to reinforce that one more time. Um, Taking that time to test your setup, not just not just of the lighting, but the system as a whole, it's it's critical to achieving good images, which are obviously so important to the success of a, of a good LPR system. So, um, you know, as, as we've discussed, there's a large number of variables with these types of projects. You need to consider those. You know, test the system out in different weather conditions, different times of day, um, vehicles traveling at different speeds. The more testing that can be done prior to full deployment, the greater the chance of achieving a successful um, implementation. And it's also important, again, as I've mentioned earlier, to take a systems-wide approach. You should be taking a close look at your camera setup and your lens or filtering, and of course your lighting. And the quality of that final image is based on a combination of all these key optical elements. So if we apply the magic formula for the camera, lens, and filter setup, which we discussed earlier, we apply those initial lighting considerations that we discussed, so you've chosen your, your wavelength and your lighting mode, and you've considered the site and the application specific requirements, so distance, angle, physical location, required control features, and so on. You then need to select the power of the size of the illuminator which you require, which effectively means you need to decide how much power to put on scene. So um, here we'll provide you with a suggested required power level, um, but I will add that it does make a number of critical assumptions. So we'll firstly just take a look at those, what those assumptions are. So actual performance, will be entirely dictated by the quality of the camera, the lens, any filtering, and how they're configured. And once again, as I've said, there's no, there's definitely no substitute for testing that will that will confirm the performance of the overall system. Um, we have seen the vast number of variables involved. So this is a, a technically challenging task. But as an as an as an initial guide at Reatech, we would suggest a target level of, of illumination on the plate around 10 to 20 microwatts per centimeter squared. So to put this into perspective, um, for normal video surveillance, for security applications, we would propose a target level of 0.35 microwatts per centimeter squared. The camera and lens setup of a, um, used for LPR dramatically increases the amount of light required to illuminate the plate, but critically because the vast number of number plates retro reflective means that the actual amount of light required is not as high as you might have thought or you might have considered so because most of the light is useful and usable for the camera whereas with non retro reflective objects more than 80 percent of the light is is not useful or usable for the camera so that's an important factor to to, to distinguish so 
how have we come up with that figure or how do we know? So in short, we spent a lot of time developing our own products uh, and product for our customers. And we spent many, many, many test nights establishing the performance requirements. So we've, we've done it empirically, um, but we have battled up with, with theory and calculation from first principles as well. So, um, and the results are surprisingly consistent when we, when we apply those. So in summary, um, we need high shutter speed to reduce motion blur. We need a bigger f-stop to overcome unwanted light sources, improving that focus and depth of field. And we need a band pass filter to reduce unwanted glare and ambient light. Combined, um, that reduces ambient available, sorry, that reduces the available light by a factor of um, 355 when we multiply that together. But as we said, if you consider that a retroreflective plate will be nine times more reflective, so 90% versus 10% retroreflectivity, then thankfully we only need 40 times more light. Um, if we multiply 40 by 0.35, we arrive at just under 40 megawatts per second, um, sorry, megawatts per centimeter squared, which proves our rule of thumb between 10 and 20. Um, Megawatts per centimeter squared. And in distance terms, the distance at which you achieve 40 times more light is approximately one sixth um, of the original distance or the square root of 40. So appreciate this is, is fairly heavy mass. We, as, as I said, we'll be we'll be sharing the slides um, afterwards so you can you can take a bit more time to go through it, but it does very helpfully deliver um, us a simple rule of thumb. So this is the, the rate out rule of thumb, firstly looking at constant light. So if you divide our quota security distance by a factor six times, um, which means a unit specified to achieve 200 meters for video surveillance security, we would suggest testing it around 33 meters for, for an LPR project. And that would deliver over 30 megawatts um, per centimeter squared at the target distance. Our rule of thumb now for, for pulse light. So when we're considering use of pulse light, firstly factor in the power uplift, but don't forget the effects of the inverse square law. By way of example, if you double the power output um, by, by pulsing, then that means you'll have double the power at the same distance, or you'll have the same power at 1.4 times the distance. And I'll say it one more time, there really is no substitute for testing to confirm the performance of the, of the overall system. Just a final note now to say um, that we have covered other ITS specific lighting challenges such as like the driver or multi-occupancy detection systems and also container recognition systems. So we've got some excellent resources on our, on our website specifically with regards to, to LPR and these other ITS applications um, includes white papers and previous webinar recordings. A couple of those white papers we've actually attached as handouts to the webinar. So you, should, you should be able to download those from your control panel. Um, but yeah, please check those out and on our website also. So that concludes the webinar. I think just a, a note to say thank you very much for, for attending in your, your time and attention um, and listening. Um, we're now going to spend a little bit of time to answer any questions you may have. Um, anything too technical, I've got my colleagues, Tony White and John Patterson, waiting in the wings. So um, please send those in now using the, um, the question section of your control panel. Um, if you were if you were on early at the start of the webinar, um, you may have seen that we, we put the, um, the translation of the, the ten most spoken languages for the phrase number plate um, or license plate. Um, so I will quickly reveal these now while while we're waiting for any questions to come in. And so obviously we had the, the translation in English, but the other nine um, that we're looking for were, were Mandarin, Hindu, Spanish, French, Arabic, Bengali. Russian, Portuguese, and lastly Indonesian. So, um, well done to anybody if you if you manage to get all those all those right. Um, so, I'm just going to quickly run through see if you've got any questions now. So, if you bear with me while I quickly check of those. Uh, there is one question here. So, um, do you have a list of surveillance cameras that can be used with with pulse light? Um, John, do you perhaps want to pick that one up? 
Okay, um, surveillance cameras generally don't have the output required for um, to uh, synchronize the shutter. It, it's generally so the more machine vision orientated cameras that provide that output. Um, generally, most machine vision cameras will have that. Uh, we try not to sort of tend to specify any particular cameras, but if you sort of look at um, any of the big names of machine vision, uh, if they have a uh, configurable output, then these will generally uh, allow you to synchronize. If you have any cameras in mind, we are quite happy to have a look at that particular camera and advise if it is possible to connect that. Great, thank you very much. Um, there's another question here, why would you ever use constant light? I mean, it's, it's really just for ease of setup and configuration, and it will also work with pretty much every camera that's on the market. It doesn't have to be Take the setup to pulse. So, if it is a short range application, uh, possibly car parking or so access control, then a constant light will, will operate and it is very easy to set up and it will work with any camera. Great, thank you very much. There's a couple of questions here just about the slides and things. So, um, we'll, be, we'll be sharing the slides after the webinar. So, anyone who is in attendance will get a, an email with copy of the slides um, and we'll also be putting the, the record on our website in the next, next day or so um, and there's a question as well about confirmation of attendance so uh, yes if you need confirmation of attendance we can provide you with a certificate to confirm that so um, if that is requirement please get in touch and um, if you've put a message on the chat I can see that and we can we can get in touch with, uh, with what you need for that so so no problem. Um, uh, Callum it might be worth going through the questions that we had this morning as well so I think we had one, not to put you on the spot, John, but you answered it expertly this morning. Somebody was asking about being able to send the trigger over the network, whether that would be possible or not. Um, so, yeah, so can you send the trigger over the network? Uh, that isn't really possible because the network will have certain time delays and latency in it. So by the time the camera has sent a command to the, uh, to the illuminator to actually trigger it, then it's probably missed that sort of opportunity to, uh, to synchronize with the shutter and that timing will vary uh, on the network with the traffic at that time. Yeah, another question that we had this morning was about uh, the viability of using 730 nanometer LEDs rather than 850, if you could give the guys your view on that. I mean 730 nanometer LEDs are generally very good for if you need to see in the vehicle. Uh, but from the sort of LPR devices plate capture, they don't generally uh, provide that much advantage over 850. Uh, if anything, it can be a hindrance because they do look very red for the eye. So on a sort of free running uh, uh, road or uh, freeway, then that can be conceived as a, a red line which can cause issues. And the control situations, if it's a, again an entry point, uh, then there is some vouchers, but it's more from the scene in the vehicle rather than the LPR side of it. Uh, and we had one final question, which was of a highly technical and specialist nature. So I'm not going to ask John to answer it because we're still trying to formulate our response on it. But it was a question about the MTBF of Pulse systems. Uh, and I think the simple statement is there are so many different variables in the way that you can set up your pulse width, your pulse height, and your pulse frequency. It would be impossible for us to provide MTBF calculations for all of those variations. I think we, all we can say uh, with confidence is that it will deliver similar lifetimes to our standard constant products. So you're in no worse position if you go constant or pulsed. But that was a, a highly, highly technical question that I didn't want to put John on the spot. But uh, thank you. Thank you. There, is, there is one more question which has come in. I'm not sure um, if we'll be able to find an answer today, but it's uh, Victoria asked, what is the limit on the distance from the, from the camera? Is that from the camera to the illuminator? I would, pres I would presume so, yes. It doesn't yeah, specify it that. I mean, it's really getting that as close as possible. Um, very, I haven't got the exact numbers in front of me and it will vary, uh, but just moving it very slightly, even a couple of centimetres or inches, does have a big difference on the 
the amount of light that is reflected back to the camera, certainly with uh, retro reflective number plates, where they rely on the sort of camera and the light being as close as possible. Yeah. So if it, if it was about the location of the infrared, I absolutely or any lighting, I absolutely agree with John. It's critical to be as close as possible to the camera and light, lighting together. Together, they must be at less than 30 degrees uh, angle of incidence to the number plate, or else the retro reflectivity starts to wane. If the question was really about how far can I undertake number plate capture, well, you've got the restraints of your camera and your lens performance, but in our standard lighting set webinar, we talk about the fact that our lights shine to the moon and back, uh, which is true, but the amount of returned energy is very low. You, what you've got to say to yourself is we've set the performance target of being 10 to 20 um, microwatts per square centimetre at the target distance. So if you have that amount of light at whatever distance, you should be able to get a good image and a good capture of the number plate. So if you target that that range of power on scene, uh, you're, 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 the only restriction is how much lighting you can get to, to provide that power. Okay, thank you very much. So I think that's all the questions um, on here now. We will stay online for another couple of minutes just in case there's any any late questions. Um, but I would just like to thank you all again for, for your attendance. It's very much appreciated. If there are any more questions or anything you'd like to discuss offline, of course, we're here and, and happy to do that. Um, but thank you again for, for taking your time to, to attend this webinar. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.